Genesis chapter 2, God made the world in six days. No, really seven days because he wasn't done creating until after the full week. He made one more thing. He made a day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made and he rested the seventh day from all his work which he had done and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, made it holy because in it he rested from all his work which God created and made. He did not make it holy for himself. He made it holy for man to remember. The Bible says the Sabbath was made for man. It doesn't say the Sabbath was made for Jews. The word there is anthropos. It means mankind, humanity. And it's first time also you're going to find the word seven mentioned three times. It says seven, seven, seven. It's a number associated with God. The seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day. Very specific. You get to the last book of the Bible. It's got another number associated with man who was made on the sixth day and it's 666. So you got this contest between the worship of God and the worship of man that goes on through the Bible. Now you go to the Ten Commandments. You find them in Exodus chapter 20 verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you should labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, your son, your daughter, so forth. But it very clearly says, do all your work, six days, seventh day, holy time. This is one of the Ten Commandments spoken by God's voice. They are not ten suggestions. They're not ten recommendations. God spoke with his own voice, wrote with his own finger, his eternal law, moral law for all his people, for all the world, for that matter. So which day is the seventh day? Some people say, well, you can't really know. Just using the Bible, uh, well, if we start with the dictionary. That's not the Bible. Dictionary, seventh day, Saturday, seventh day of the week. You go to the Bible, tells us that Jesus was crucified on the preparation day, which we know to be Friday. Uh, then it says they went home and they kept the Sabbath according to the commandment, the seventh day. And then he rose, they came to the tomb early Sunday morning, the first day. People call it Easter Sunday. So you can even look in the Bible, it's pretty clear. In a hundred and, it's not this way in English. In English we call the seventh day Saturday. But in a lot of other languages, Spanish, how do you say Saturday? Sabado. Portuguese? Sabado. Russian? Subota. I got some Russians here. And 105 languages of the world, the word for the seventh day of the week, what we call Saturday, is Sabbath day. Isn't that interesting? So why is everyone going to church on Sunday? Is Sunday sacred? Where did that happen? All right. <clears throat> so I actually appreciate him saying that God created a day on the seventh day. Because that means he was working. Right, Doug? Which uh, poses serious problems for your guys' claim regarding the eternality of the seventh day Sabbath. Because a common claim made by the SDA church is that the Sabbath is eternal. Not just that the substance of the command is eternal. They were getting this from other people, by the way, folks. But they misunderstood what those people were saying. It's not just that the substance of the command is eternal, which is that God is worthy and do a portion uh, of his image bearer's time to step away from taking uh, the command to work and subdue the earth. No, they claim the seventh day Sabbath was being observed in heaven prior to the creation of the earth. Yet here, Doug says the seventh day was created at a point after the creation of the earth. Days are also dependent upon the lights that God created, the sun and the moon, which are also parts of creation. So there are a number of problems with this claim. But Doug, I agree. The Sabbath was made for man. It's interesting, though, that you guys never cite Deuteronomy 5 when citing the fourth commandment, only Exodus exclusively. We'll see why I say this in a bit. Um, but I want to answer his question here. Where did the idea of the first day come from? I want to do a little bit of biblical theology here. You might be asking, isn't all of theology biblical theology? <laughs> and in a sense, yes. But more specifically, biblical theology is when we examine the process and unfolding of the biblical narrative as it moves toward the ultimate goal, which is God's final revelation of the, uh, uh, of the person and work of Jesus. So I want to do some of that here in Genesis, which is the beginning of redemptive history. 
At creation, there were a number of ordinances. Labor. God commanded uh, man to subdue the earth and work it. Genesis 2.15. Marriage. Genesis 2.24-25. Fruitfulness, be fruitful and multiply. The argument is typically made that the Sabbath is not one of these because the text nowhere states that the Sabbath was commanded at creation. Uh, the problem that I and many others have with this is, again, we don't have to utilize the verbatim fallacy or we don't want to utilize the verbatim fallacy. Um, when we look at the whole of Scripture, there are later references in redemptive history where we are told that the Sabbath is rooted back in creation such as the first giving of the law in Exodus. But it also seemed to be Christ's interpretation when he declares that the Sabbath was made for man, Mark 2.27, as Doug mentioned, which would add to it, uh, which would add that to the list of labor, marriage, and fruitfulness. Set in the context of creation, the Sabbath was made, he also used that word too, did you notice that, folks? Made for man and not the other way around, not made for angels made for man, and made. But Christ seems to agree that the Sabbath was observed as a creation ordinance when mankind was made. If this is true, which I would argue obviously it is, then all attempts to treat the Sabbath as unique to Israel are eliminated. And I'm not going to get into that in tonight's stream because the focus of tonight is juxtaposing the first day over and against the last day. So even if you disagree, please track with me and listen because this is still applicable to the SDA church because they do believe it's a creation ordinance. So they have to deal with what is being put out tonight. But I don't think Doug realizes what Jesus said regarding Mark 2.27. The Sabbath was made. And made for who? Man. Man is not eternal. This also poses issues with the SDA narrative regarding it being eternal. That in the pre-Earth origin story, you have a huge expanse of time between the creation of Earth and the rest of uh, the universe. Yet the seventh-day Sabbath was supposedly being observed prior to the creation of Earth, even though it was made for man who didn't exist yet. But nevertheless, Doug, I agree. The Sabbath was a creation ordinance made for man and is a memorial of creation. But not just that. Redemption and rest as well, which we will get into uh, later. But there's something, sir, that you miss in the narrative by not digging deep enough that is absolutely vital in all of this. In paradise, back in Eden, God laid out his intention for mankind, which included taking dominion over the earth, a.k.a. working. They were to be married. They were to have children filling the earth with other image bearers. They were not to work themselves ragged. They were to rest from subduing the earth and step away from the command to work and worship God as a family. Essentially, uh, they were to mirror God in creation. But Doug mentioned day six being preparation day regarding the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Well, Genesis is prior to that, obviously, in redemptive history. And we see that the pattern of six-day preparation was not arbitrary. For example, notice here. Exodus 16. 22 through 30, talks about preparation day. Notice what it says. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See." The Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. So folks, this is not arbitrary. This is modeled after something that came before. Before the Sabbath came on the sixth day, the Israelites were to prepare for the Sabbath. 
This is modeled after God in creation. God was teaching his people something. In the original creation week, God's preparations included one, preparing a home, which was Eden. Two, a community in which to worship God when he created Eve. When he created a helpmate for Adam. He did all of this in preparation before the day in which he then rested. So there's a motif of this seen in Exodus where man is modeling God, which is why he commanded it. The sixth day being preparation day was not arbitrary. It was on that day all necessary work was to be done ahead of time to enable worship on the Sabbath. But before the fall of Adam and Eve into sin, mankind was supposed to start his week with a Sabbath. And this is what the SDA church does not catch. After the fall, man ended the week on the Sabbath. Notice, the days of creation are all counted from evening to evening. In the Western way of counting, day six started on Friday night and finished Saturday night. And the wording for each day is, is interesting. So Genesis 1.15, for example, it says there was evening and there was morning the first day, etc. Adam had not experienced the evening of day six and maybe not even the morning. Eve for certain did not experience anything but a short period at the end of the sixth day. Why do I say this? The order of events on day six were one, the creation of land creatures. Two, the creation of Adam. Three, the creation of the garden. Four, God gives instructions to man. Five, God brings the animals before Adam to be named, followed by a desire for him to have his own mate. Six, then the creation of Eve. Seven, more instructions. And eight, ending the day with the declaration that it was very good. If you compare Genesis 1, 29 through 31 with the time span of Genesis 2, 7 through 22, it is clear that Eve was created toward the end of day six, just in time to hear God's blessings and commands in 1, 28 through 31, and prior to the ushering in of God's rest. This would mean that mankind's first full day was God's Sabbath day. Day seven of God's week, as defined by evening and morning, was mankind's first day, as defined by evening and morning. Man was not there on day one, two, three, etc. So prior to the fall, man started his week on the Sabbath. God prepared and fashioned man on preparation day before they would come in and, and enter his rest and then go out and take dominion. And since that's the case, very clearly prior to the fall, man's first day was God's Sabbath day. The original design was for man to start his week in worship of God. And then man would have followed this pattern every seven days by starting the week on the Sabbath, on God's seventh day. The SDA church completely misses this. It was not man's seventh day in the beginning, Doug. <laughs> it was God's. Technically, it was man's first. This is vital, 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 vital. Because this then becomes tainted by man's rebellion and sin. When man sinned, the rest that God provided man was symbolized in the Sabbath, but was forfeited by, by man's disobedience and wouldn't be restored again until the second Adam, whose future obedience would restore all things, meaning Jesus. So in Christ, the day for the Sabbath is restored to its pre-fall place, and man can once again rest in God's finished work of recreation, aka new creation, and redemption, before he then goes forth in obedience to the Lord by, uh, of subduing the earth, which is why Exodus 20 roots the Sabbath in creation, and Deuteronomy 5 roots it in redemption, both of which also have to do with rest. And all three are necessary in understanding the Sabbath, creation, rest, and redemption. The Lord Jesus restored what man lost. Man is now back to starting his week in communion with God. 
What came with man's rebellion was the curse that was put on the creation. Both Adam and his rest were cursed. What did God say in Genesis 3, uh, 17 through 19? The ground Adam was to work was now cursed. In pain he shall now eat of it. Thorns and thistles would be produced. More than likely talking about exhaustion. Hence why he says he'll work now by the sweat of his brow. So now, after the fall, man's labor and rest was impacted by his disobedience. He broke the creation, and that impacted all areas. However, we also see redemption and blessing found along with the curse in the first proclamation of the gospel in Genesis 3.15, where God foretells of Jesus who would come and destroy the works of the devil, remembering or, or redeeming the creation that man broke. Notice here what Dr. Philip Kaiser says in his book, Sunday is the first day Sabbath. He says, quote, Genesis 3.15 prophesies of the coming of Jesus who would destroy the works of the devil. Apart from the coming of Jesus, the promise of rest in the Sabbath would have been false and the Sabbath would have ceased to be a meaningful command. So God placed the time for worship at the end of the week. In effect, God told Adam, so you want to be like God? So you want to start your week with dominion rather than rest? I'll let you do so. In fact, to show how miserable all dominion can be apart from grace, I will command you to do as I did. From this point on, you must begin your week with dominion, and only after long and hard striving will I give you rest. The fact that there still is rest is a promise that one day at the end of this age, the promised Messiah will bring true rest. He, as the second Adam, will accomplish what you failed to. So the Sabbath was no longer celebrated at the beginning of the week, but at the end of the week. The rest was cursed as well as the dominion. Close quote. So the second Adam, Jesus Christ, did everything the first Adam failed to do, restoring what was lost. He obeyed perfectly, and he is subduing the earth perfectly as he rules and reigns, which was a command for Adam to do. But Christ is doing so perfectly as he rules and reigns from heaven on his throne while all of his enemies are being made a footstool, 1 Corinthians 15. In the old creation, the Sabbath day was a reminder of man's inability. But it also pointed to what Christ would do by redeeming what man broke. It was a reminder of the failure of the first Adam, but an optimistic pointer to what the second Adam would restore and accomplish. So by his redemption, Jesus made a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19. Romans 8, 19 through 25. And then he entered his rest after that work was completed, Hebrews 4.10. The first day Sabbath memorializes the new creation work of Jesus in redemption and is a reminder of the promise of our consummation state as we labor for Christ's kingdom and seek to subdue all things, Hebrews 2. Mankind is still commanded to subdue the earth, but essentially sin has caused us to fail at this. Which is why Christ not only enters his rest as God, but as our representative second Adam, and he labors to subdue all things to himself on our behalf. Hebrews 1, Hebrews 2. Which is why we have the first rest, or, or we, have to, we have to first rest in his finished work of redemption. And by being in him, this subduing can be fulfilled like everything else is by and through him. That's the key. If you aren't resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ, the gospel rest for the soul, a day means absolutely nothing. Nothing. And this is one of the areas where the SDA view goes completely off the rails. Now that Jesus has come, like Ignatius rightly recognized, it's an insult to God's grace to continue to celebrate a seventh-day Sabbath as if he has not come. SDAs go berserk when I say this. But hey, let the chips fall where they may. It's the truth. It's the equivalent of saying the second Adam hasn't come. Redemption hasn't happened. We're still looking for what's actu what that's actually pointing to. Which is why it's so interesting whenever they appeal to Jews to try and support this. And it's like, yeah, they're doing the same. They're making the same error. They reject the Messiah. <laughs> they they miss the, the, the substance of. Uh. But circumcision, that was the same way. It was a blessing in the old covenant. Because it pointed to Jesus. But once Jesus has come to get circumcised religiously, it insults Christ's finished work. 
Same thing with the memorial of the old creation that pointed to Jesus who would come and redeem it. But that is, in a nutshell, the foundation for the first day Sabbath position. Man started his week with the seventh day before the fall, his first day being God's seventh day. After the fall, man now ends his week with the Sabbath until Jesus, the second Adam, comes and restores what the first Adam broke by redeeming the creation that fell, making a new creation, and restoring what man lost in the fall. The Messiah writes the relationship of God with his people, restores the created order to how it was intended, starting our week with him. The day is the memorial, not the substance. It points to something. Both the seventh and the first days pointed to Jesus, one for the purpose of the gospel hope of redemption and the redeeming of the creation that fell, the other, meaning the first day, to the accomplishment of that redemption in the person and work of Jesus Christ, who reestablished the pre-fall relationship of God and man. As our representative, he entered into eternity as uh, ahead of us. And it is through him and him alone that we will one day physically enter into the eternal state with glorified bodies to dwell in union with our maker forever, which is the true promised land, the eternal rest of God. And as the biblical narrative is unfolding, we see that the Bible or, or that the, the Sabbath is rooted in rest, redemption, and creation. Because ultimately, like everything in scripture, it pointed to the person and work of Jesus. Those of you that have been here when we've talked through Hebrews 4, 1 through 11, that is exactly what the author is tying together. We're not going to go through that tonight. We've done so a, a number of times. We're going to focus on other areas tonight, but it's, it's talking about how Jesus is a better mediator than Moses, who led a better Exodus, is a better Joshua who led a better redemption into a better promised land, the heavenly Mount Zion, and brought about a better creation by redeeming the one that fell. What we will have in eternity is not a return to the Garden of Eden, by the way, like the SDA church posits. It will be far better than that. Y'all see why I'm constantly talking about new creation now? <laughs> this was like a flyover. These are the sorts of things, though, that Ignatius, Tertullian, Justin Martyr, early church fathers were recognizing from Scripture. Other generations then continued studying and building on where those early Christians left off. So this is the foundation. We will look at more uh, as Doug's presentation goes on, but this is the starting point. Not the Pope, not Constantine, or any of the other conspiracies. It has to do with seeing the whole biblical narrative looking deeper than merely the verbatim fallacy and reading a couple verses here and there with the great controversy as the lens to interpret them. Part of which is that this wasn't the plan all along. The heavenly trio had to hold a council after the fall where the father had to be convinced of a plan presented by Jesus, who after three tries convinced the father to accept his proposed plan, which was what really was a plan B. <laughs> you know, this is always part of the plan. God revealing himself more deeply to his creation, redeeming a people out of the fall to demonstrate his mercy and grace, taking their penalty upon himself in the, the greatest act of love, which also demonstrating while also demonstrating his, his justice and anger towards sin. All of this stuff was a revelation from God to the creation of who he is. And as time unfolds, we see all of that leading to the point of Jesus Christ.